Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you wherever you may be. Welcome back to Log Tech Live. Uh, I am Eric Johnson, uh, host of Log Tech Live every two weeks as normal. Uh, when I'm not hosting this show, I am the senior technology editor at the Journal of Commerce. Uh, really delighted to be with you today. I might be suffering from a bit of jet lag. Uh, for those of you who watch the show regularly, you know that I was just in India. I uh, literally got back 10 hours ago, so we'll see how this goes. I'll try to stay coherent for the entire 45 minutes, but if I start uh, speaking gibberish, please let me know in the comments, and I'll, uh, I will uh, try to drink a you know, pound of coffee or something to get myself uh, going again. But it was a fantastic trip. I had an amazing time as usual. I ate about 70,000 pounds, too many, too much food um, while I was there. So I have the whole fall to uh, work that off. Um, but really exciting to be on the ground as always in Asia. I got a chance to go to Singapore for a week and really see all the activity that's going on there as well. Some of you may know my colleague, Peter Tershwell, has uh, uh, relocated um, to Singapore. Um, so he's there. There's a lot of um, activity both inside the Journal of Commerce business and just in general there. Um, so anyway, uh, lots to get through today. Uh, I will try to go as quick as I can. Um, you've heard me talk about this, but now we are literally in the home stretch for uh, JOC Inland Distribution, which is about five weeks out in uh, Chicago. We start September 25th. I will be there leading a whole bunch of sessions around um, surface transportation technology. We have a session on TMS. We have a session on uh, pricing, uh, truckload pricing, and we have a very cool session. I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one with uh, Chad Olison of AVRL, who has been on this show before, doing some very interesting things on the automation side uh, for um, primarily for freight brokers, but also shippers and um, carriers as well. You do not want to miss that session. You do not want to miss the event as a whole. Literally the best, most substantive event on the uh, surface transportation and logistics side in North America. So hope to see you there. Um, you can register, there's links there. Uh, a couple months later, I will be in, no, a couple months, one month after that, I will be in Abu Dhabi for the IAPH World Ports Conference. Similar thing, I'm leading about six sessions that are very digital or technology focused um, for the World Ports Conference. Really, really fa uh, looking forward to this one. This show is awesome, it brings together uh, many of the biggest ports in the world, all the stakeholders that are uh, attached to those ports um, to just talk about best practices, technology and otherwise to, to sort of share amongst each other. Um, so that should be another fantastic uh, event. Last year's was in Vancouver, this year in Abu Dhabi. Can't wait to get there. Um, so again, links are in the comment if you want to register. Um, ping me if you need a, a discount. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I know some people. Um, one other thing, TPM uh, has, registration is open. I forgot to mention this on the last show, uh, but TPM registration opened earlier this month. If you've not registered, you definitely want to do that. We've had great uptake already. As everyone knows, hotels are always the thing with TPM. Allow, registering right now allows you to get access to rooms um, very early in the, in the game, which is important because there's always more people that want rooms than uh, are, have rooms. Uh, rooms are available in downtown Long Beach. So uh, really hope to see you there in March. We're right in the middle of huge program uh, uh, development right now. As, as we've talked about on this show before, TPM Tech, uh, which I lead, is now being integrated into TPM so that we have them over the, over the four days uh, within TPM. We have more space available this year to us at TPM, so it's going to be really interesting to – see how all these all these different elements fit into that bigger space. And, and part of that is, is integrating TPM tech into the broader TPM program. So more news on that. We're going to come out with a preliminary agenda fairly soon on that. Um, so um, stay tuned. Um, real quick, uh, I always talk about the blended pledge. Please support the blended pledge. But this week I wanted to especially highlight, obviously most people know Maui, um, was uh, really ravaged last uh, week by a uh, fire um, that devastated parts of the island. Um, I don't have a link or any specific company that I'm going to point you to, but just Google, how can I help Maui, Maui support freight forwarder, Maui support logistics. There's a bunch of different forwarders, especially 
um, that are doing uh, relief work or, or figuring out how to coordinate some supplies um, for that area. So if you want to help, just Google and I'm sure you'll find a worthwhile cause to, to get behind, but I um, encourage you to definitely do that if, uh, if you're so inclined. Okay, news of the week. Uh, real quick, uh, before I get to my guest, we have a great guest today. Uh, can't wait to introduce him in a few minutes. Um, but let me just run through a few stories that uh, I think are worthwhile to take note of. Um, so my colleague, Terry Griffiths, um, talked, uh, she's our FMC uh, reporter extraordinaire these days. Um, she reported on Rebecca Dye's recommendations um, to help fix kind of container flow. Rebecca, or Di, uh, uh, Commissioner Dye has been, you know, this has been a long-term sort of uh, initiative for her predating the pandemic of trying to figure out like where problem areas lie in port um, flow. And um, she's offered recommendations before she's led su supply chain sort of um, efficiency initiatives. And um, so she's she's released uh, recently another set of recommendations. This story is about how the NSAC, the Shipper Advisory Committee to the FMC, their sort of reactions to these latest sets of initiatives. And while, it, definitely read the story, while they're supportive for the most part, if not very supportive of some of the things that the recommendations go into, a lot of them suggest they need more teeth, they need timelines. Um, some, you know, these are around empty container returns, uh, earliest return date, those sort of core processes that shippers are really um, hit by, especially on the export side. Um, mostly they're just talking about how these are things that the NSAC, this, the advisory committee has been talking about as well. So um, where is the urgency when they were uh, sort of advising the FMC on this and, and putting timelines to this so they're not just sort of, you know, empty, uh, empty is the wrong word. Um, they don't sort of just continue ad, fi ad finitum um, without a without a hard deadline to work to. So definitely encourage you to read the story. There's a lot in there, um, a lot of feedback, both in and out of the NSAC about what these um, recommendations actually mean and how valuable they are to shippers. Um, another story I wanted to highlight, um, I wrote about this last week, Convoy, you know, they get, I get a lot, I get sort of pinged on this a lot of times. Convoy definitely gets pinged on this for sort of trying to repackage old ideas as new ones. Um, but I think, you know, on the whole, I think Convoy has been good for the industry in terms of just like getting people aligned on how tech can help or data in this case can help. Um, revitalize some some ideas that have been around for a long time. And, and in this case, Convoy has rolled out a new program where they are they are saying they will guarantee a uh, truckload time will be a truckload will be on time within 15 minutes, either early or late uh, from a given point. And uh, if the, if it's not, then they will share in the, whatever penalty uh, the shipper uh, is uh, owes for being early, too early, or too late. And in some cases, um, Convoy told me that in some cases, those penalties on the retail side can be 3% of the cost of goods sold. So, you know, I think it's a good thing anytime a service provider, in this case, a freight broker, is sort of putting their money where their mouth is. And I guess they're confident enough in their data to say that we can, um, uh, we can hit these target dates or these target times within 15 minute window, which as we all know, uh, is fairly specific, right? It's it's tough to be on time that to that uh, level of precision. So, very interesting. Um, the last thing I'll point out um, before we move on and to our conversation today is my colleagues within S and P earlier this month uh, uh, just released this report. Uh, this is a look forward journal which we do pretty much quarterly, and they sort of tackle one specific topic. In this case. It tackled the huge topic of India and whether this is India's moment to sort of uh, take its its huge economy and and take and get it to the next level. Sort of banking on the idea that people are starting to try to decouple. I don't know how successful they are is another issue, but from China and looking to alternative places in Asia to really sort of move manufacturing and and are the logistics uh, networks. Um, capable of supporting a large scale migration of, of uh, manufacturing to India. So the link is in the, the comments here. Uh, definitely look in, definitely encourage you 
look through all the different aspects of this report. My colleague, especially Rahul Kapoor and Chris Rogers on the uh, economic side, they really looked at kind of the logistics um, network and infrastructure in India and whether that is set up to support a huge increase in manufacturing, export manufacturing there. So um, really huge report that was a uh, big undertaking across the company that I uh, would love uh, for you all to look at when you have a moment. And obviously I was just in India, so this is super meaningful for me as well. Um, okay. So with that said, it's time to bring on my guest this week. It's uh, today joining me is Stefan Kalman, who's a CEO of a company called Nexiat, which you may or may not have heard of, but we're going to find out a lot more about it over the next 30 minutes. Um, thank you, uh, Rob. Glad, as always, for you to join us today from Tennessee. Really Absolutely. So, Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. How are thank you? you for having me. Good morning to you, Eric. Cool. You're joining from Switzerland today, correct? I'm calling in from Zurich. Yeah, as you can see in the background, beautiful Zurich. Amazing. Great. Uh, it's been far too long since I've been in Switzerland, so I will have to figure out a way to get there at some point. Well, this is well, an open invitation. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, just as a starting point, can you give uh, everyone a little bit of background on yourself and then sort of what Nexiot is in case they don't mm -hmm. know what, what the company okay. is? So, you know, I've been uh, an entrepreneur in the in, in the technology industry for for the last uh, 25 years. Uh, I originally came for for private equity, but uh, I, I've used various I used to run various uh, companies in the space. Nexit is um, is a tech company who's really focused on digitizing assets, which are really difficult uh, to digitize. And there might be lots of reasons for it. Either they're operating in uh, in difficult environments where it's really cold, really warm. But the main driver, and and we're really focused on on the shipping industry, on maritime, on rail. The main driver is that those assets don't have any power. And if you don't have any power, it's really challenging to send signals for a very long time. So what we do is we convert, you know, boxes of steel, whether they're, you know, rail cars or into mobile containers from just being boxes of steel into smart assets, you know, smart rail cars, smart, um, smart shipping containers. So your business is completely focused on logistics transportation, right? Ex, you know, very, very specialized on that uh, on that niche. We're based out of Zurich, but it's a pretty global business. You know, the Swissness helps us maybe to operate a little bit in this uh, geopolitical complex world, and we will probably take a little bit, you know, talk about it uh, more later. Uh, but this is this is uh, this is a totally global business. We're operating in 150 countries approximately. Okay, um, so. What was sort of the genesis of the idea for the company? And, and can you give an insight into kind of who your customers are? Yeah. So, so, you know, I brought one of our, you know, sensors we're using. And, and I just said, you know, um, it's, it's difficult to operate in environments where there's no powers. You know, from truck, and you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you spoke about Conway and, and, and what they're offering on trucks. Trucks have had power always in GPS. Now the shipping, the shipping container, and that's been probably the biggest challenge also this, to this industry, doesn't have any power. Mm -hmm. So historically, whatever you put on there had to be replaced, you know, uh, once a year or twice a year, and that's not feasible. So we created the device, and it has a solar panel, as you can see on top of there, so that it actually can, you know, create real-time data for eight to ten years, and that's a very long time. So this needs, you know, it, it needs a lot of intelligence behind it. And um, and then it's you know zero maintenance because you you know once you've actually put a device on a container that container travels around the world so you will never be able to catch it again. I having just traveled back from uh, India through London to DC where uh, I'm I'm normally based. My yeah. son who's ten and obviously because he hears me talking about this all the time yeah. is hyper aware of containers anywhere out in the real world he's always pointing out there's a cma cgm yeah. container i was like oh is it on a truck he's like no it was just sitting in a empty lot and it didn't look and it didn't look like they knew where it was so it, it, it's a blessing but it's you know it's very similar like when you know when you're expecting a baby you see proms everywhere it's the yeah. same thing when you work in our industry you see shipping containers uh, everywhere yeah so the, you sure. know the customers we have are people who own assets and we will talk about, you know, um, and there's lots of uh, interesting examples at the moment, 
or the shippers, you know, because the, you know, the drive to digitize this industry comes from both sides. So the mm -hmm. asset owners have a strong interest because they want to offer better quality, better services to their own clients. And shippers have a strong interest because they want to have more reliability. When will the goods actually arrive? And, and there's never been really door to door monitoring historically. There have been solutions and, you know, it's a very fragmented market. There's been lots of solutions for certain parts of the transport way, but never door to door. And that's, you know, it's something we've changed. And, and if you think about it, and you mentioned also a couple of examples earlier, there's a lot of uncertainty in our industry. You never know when the ship arrives. You never know whether the driver will be available. Uh, you never know, uh, you know, whether the goods arrive in the same condition as you send them originally. So what we're really trying to do with the technology here is remove uncertainty. So this is an area I was really excited to have you on because this is an area I've, I, you know, I write a lot about visibility in general. Um, I've written the last few years, um, even predating the pandemic around kind of advances on the, you know, the hardware sensors, the asset mm -hmm. tracking side, rather than just data generated by, you know, EDI around, a, you know, shipment milestones by the carrier themselves. Um, it's a fragmented market. You use that word. And, and that was actually a word I had in my notes to, to, to ask you about, because it's, to my mind, it's extremely fragmented by mode, uh, by geographic region, by different types of customers. How, how do you sort of fit into this really fragmented world of different providers that, uh, especially on the user, on the data user side, right? Like, obviously I think, and we, we'll get into this in a bit. There's makes a lot of sense in terms of tracking assets from the carrier side, from the, you know, the asset owner side. But if you're a shipper and you need to know where your, where your stuff is and the condition of it, um, there's lots of different avenues you could potentially turn to. So how do you sort of fill totally. that, that landscape? And, and, and if you, you know, if you look at it from the eyes of the shippers, you don't actually want to open and operate 20 different platforms. You know, you're interested to get the data from one single source and, and 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 that's a little bit the challenge because you know let's start with the rail industry extremely fragmented as you said you know there's not a single operator in the world which operates on a global basis so it will always be in certain regions different solutions and and and, and with uh, um, local solutions comes also a certain amount of uh, geopolitical um, demand for certain technologies like in the US you cannot sell, any technology which has been manufactured in China, maybe, you know, so uh, that by definition already creates, you know, a certain fragmented market. And there's hundreds of various rail players in the world. Even if we go down to the maritime world where there's only around, you know, 10 to 20 very large carriers, I think, you know, the, the challenge has been that um, because of the sheer amount of assets, it takes a very long time to actually digitize your entire fleet. And then by definition, a lot of people have looked for certain shortcuts. You know, this is the entire time of the data aggregators. It's a lot easier uh, to roll out an ERP system if you think about it. You're a purely data-driven data aggregation system than to actually physically touch every single asset in the world and put some technology on it. And that's the reason why there's even room for, you know, fragmentation because it's, you know, it obviously requires high investments uh, to fully digital transform your entire fleet. And that has created the opportunity for lots of local players. Yeah, I, I've talked a lot, both in reporting and, and on this show about how the, the it's my belief that the, that the industry, the buying side of the industry actually wants it to be fragmented, even if it's not ideal for the provider side, because they, they want choice. They don't want to be beholden to certain companies, but the, you know, the other edge of that sword is it makes buying the decision more difficult because you have more, it's like going to the supermarket and you have 50 different types of cheese to choose from instead of oh, five, right? Like you, it's going to be a more, you have to inform yourself more. So. And, and, and I think, you know, this industry needs standardization and, and, and costs is obviously also a determining factor. So, um, you, you know, um, clients want to have cheap solutions which last for a very long time. That by definition means you need to be able to produce it in certain amount of quantities. And this is probably the biggest 
uh, you know, the, the biggest entry barrier for a lot of players. Let's assume there's lots of people who work at the moment around the globe who are building similar boxes in Israel and France and the States. You know, we, we saw an announcement in Japan. The real challenge is can you actually produce hundreds of thousands of those devices where you need to have factories around the world and then, you know, deploy them also. And only if you have that scalability, then you can actually take the prices down uh, to reasonable levels. And, and because not many people can actually do that, you know, then um, that creates in itself, you know, the room for local heroes. So Israeli companies will rather buy from Israeli local heroes, you know, Japanese companies will buy a solution from local Japanese heroes, et cetera. But ultimately, I think um, um, standardization and a global approach will uh, will uh, will win. Very interesting, and and I mean, the for instance, the DCSA has done some work in terms of trying to provide that blueprint on IoT yeah. you know, sort of tracking, right? Which I think will will further what you just talked about. I, I want to get back into that cost discussion, especially from the the shipper perspective or forwarder perspective, whoever is on the buying end. Um, but maybe let's first kind of drill down into, we, I mean, the, the next layer of fragmentation beyond the things I mentioned is just that sort of simple divide between, do I use a visibility provider that is a data either aggregator or has some sort of special feed with a hard to tap into set of yeah. providers? Or do I say, no, I need, I actually need something that's physically on the asset or on the shipment like how do you mm-hmm. um how do we sort of uh, well uh, let me put it this way how, make the case for a, a sort of sensor uh or iot focused approach to this and i would say it's not an or but it's an and because okay. because you know the data aggregators have become better than anyone else in the world to actually sell and monetize data you know, this has probably also been one of the biggest challenges for the industry that actually the traditional carriers don't have a lot of experience in selling data. They're good in selling, they're good in selling boxes or spaces, but it's actually the data aggregators who've become really sophisticated in how do you actually package it for shippers who really want to have it door to door from monitoring perspective. Yeah. And and you know, the, the reason I think there is actually an end and there will be, um, there will always be the nexus of this world is because, you know, yes, we were also able, if you think about your mobile phone, we were always able, you know, to track our steps by just carrying our mobile phone around. But actually we created an entire new industry with, you know, fitness trackers and smart watches. And, you know, there's lots of sensors now. We monitor our sleep and we monitor Um, you know, all kind of different things around our health status, and it's not different on our side. You know, you can actually only control whether a door has been opened from a shipping container or whether there's humidity or temperature changes inside of a shipping container in real time if you actually have something which sits on the asset and controls it also in real time. If you actually have to wait until the ship arrives, it might be too late to take the right decision. So it's an and and an or. Yeah, three fifteen message is not telling you if a door was opened or the temperature of a container. Or there's uh, nothing you can do about it. And, and 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 you know maybe another analogy, you know, because this is also real time monitoring, but from a different perspective. We're so used to CCTV cameras now, but and 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 this is you know again you know sensors which capture data, but the real appliances then also come with OCR where you, you know monitor it, you know, gate in, gate out things or at airports, you know, face recognition, et cetera. So you need something which actually creates the data in real time so that you can create the use cases around it. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I think it's a good framework for people to sort of understand. So we've talked already a couple of times about cost. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I don't, uh, I report on this, but I don't have strong feelings one way or another because I don't have freight to move, right? I don't have to make the decision whether it makes sense to track it, you know, with a device or, or whether data is enough. What, um, but, but I will say that I think historically, most people have considered the cost of the device, as you mentioned, to be a hurdle toward, bro- you know, 
for mm -hmm. against broader adoption, right? Yeah. Is, so the first question I want to ask, is that accurate in 2023? Um, and, and if it is, how, how to sort of overcome that perception of, you know, th these things just being too expensive? Yeah, so I think it's a multifaceted um, perspective. I think cost was always used as a reason not to move forward. But I think for a very, very long time, it's actually been the reliability and the frequency of data you were able to send. Because until recently, it was not possible to build devices which would survive for eight or 10 years in the field mm -hmm. and still be able to send every 15 minutes a signal for that amount of time if you had to, at least when the asset, you know, asset is moving. Cost is obviously, you know, very significant, but but um, Hapak Lloyd, and I'm sure we will talk about Hapak Lloyd in a second, is, you know, a good example where actually it's being demonstrated to the entire industry that a full fleet rollout, you know, is an investment into a use case which brings benefits in a very short amount of time. And we can talk about the costs about a single unit, you know, it's probably... 10, $15 a year or $20, it doesn't really matter, but it's it's insignificant compared to the kind of goods you're moving around. But this is only possible if you take it to a level where you're rolling out millions of devices. You know, and if you if you stay in small quantities, by definition, you will never be able to drive down the cost level to a level where it's acceptable. But, but the hardware is only one part of it. The really expensive thing is the deployment. And this is, I think, where most organizations are concerned or at least are reluctant to start the investment is because you need to be, you know, it, just take the example of, of Hapak Lloyd. You know, the announcement of, of digitizing your entire fleet sounds very straightforward. But imagine how challenging it has been. And, and, and Hapak Lloyd has really excelled at that to catch more than a million shipping containers in less than you know 18 months in, in something like 150 ports and terminals globally. So that's the real, you know, yeah. the, the change management aspect you know, around it. That's the real, that's the real challenge and the real cost factor because you need to be working with all those ports and terminals around the world. But in the hint side, or you know, looking at it from a different perspective, if you don't start today, then you know it will take even longer because you know by definition every fleet will take you know 18 to 24 months to be fully deployed. So sooner or later you will have to start um, you know that that rollout anyway. But that's probably the biggest factor where where organizations are reluctant uh, to start that investment. It, it's literally the uh, it's it's literally the changing the airplane's engine while it's in flight sort of analogy in practice. So and it is. Um, um, yeah. Well, so, and and definitely have some questions on Hapag uh, and how that's going early uh, later on in my in my notes. But I did want to on the cost side of things. Very interesting point too. I think that gets lost in the discussion is is the you know I think people have been focused on the cost of the device without looking at the length of robustness of the device and it's it's mm. it's it's shelf life essentially like a hundred i'm just throwing a number to make it round a hundred dollar device that lasts two years it's a totally different investment than a hundred dollar advice device that lasts 10 years right so that's a great point to make on the shipper side of things i because you know i'm looking very interesting to see what carriers are doing and, and we'll talk about hot bag in a yeah. second but from the shipper side of things, I've always thought about it from the perspective of what types of cargo beyond the sort of normal use case, high risk, super high value, uh, regulated industry that has to show that it's been within a temperature or, or humidity bandwidth, shock, all those normal kind of use cases around sensors. What makes it, what takes this to the level where a shipper that has cargo that ordinarily wouldn't be considered something that was worth the extra cost to track it with a device, what takes it to that level, do you think? So, um, you know, there's lots of discussions, uh, you know, should you only focus on high value cargo? We've always made the point is that it should be on every single shipment, every single asset. And, and the reason for it is, you know, first of all, you cannot do any triage on ships. You cannot say, you know, certain goods are sitting in this part of the ship and certain goods are 
sitting on it. You know, if a fire starts, and, and, and we know there's around 2 million containers every single year, which are have either misdeclared goods or dangerous goods. If a fire starts, you want to know earlier about it uh, than, than later. No one also wants to be on the front page of any newspaper uh, that their containers or their shipments have been used to smuggle illicit goods. So there will be, you know, if you think about in today's world, um, a lot to do has to do also with brand reliability and brand reliability is, you know, both on the sustainability side, you know, you don't want to be associated with, with um, and if you think about the carbon tax, you don't want to be associated also for destroying a lot of CO2. It doesn't matter whether you, as a shipper, you produce furniture or clothes, et cetera. No one wants to be associated with wasting resources while you're shipping. So that a lot of the, the drive for technology comes through the shippers, actually. They want to monitor how much CO2 consumption is, is being used. Then it comes through the ports who actually say, you know, take take in the Benelux, you know, a lot of the ports there um, who say, you know, we want to, you know, certain shipments can no longer go through Rotterdam or, or Antwerpen if, if you cannot prove that the container has not been opened. So, you, so we will see very similar to the financial service industry where we had this entire KYC initiative, also very similar trends in, in, in the cargo industry. And in fact, you know, all the port authorities are already, uh, you know, looking at it. So there's lots, lots of um, drivers in the industry. And, and I think no one at the end of the day, no one wants to be left out because how are you going to explain to your shareholders? You, you didn't want to be the first, but you know, that's gone because, you know, Hapagloid has, thankfully, you know, help to um, to drive this industry forward. But you also don't want to be last. Um, and, and this is, I think, where we'll see a lot of the driving in the industry. Yeah, you know, it's a great point you made earlier. You don't get to choose which of your containers is uh, exposed to a potential fire or illicit activity. It's it, You don't get to say, oh, I, it, it's the $5 t-shirts that are in that box. That and, and usually it's misdeclared goods. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, children toys, which in reality are fireworks or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and the challenge is with, you know, ships being named after companies, uh, you, you know, everyone is forever going to remember the name of a spe you know, specific ship who had a block, you know, the Suez Canal or, yeah. you know, the derailment of, you know, certain rail cars or whatever. So, so brand reliability becomes really important and, and look at the hundreds of millions or, you know, sometimes even billions, which then come in claims, et cetera. You know, whatever investment will uh, be needed to digitize your entire fleet is relatively small compared to, you know, anything on the negative uh, downside there. Yeah. Uh, excellent point. I know you have a vested interest, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. So, um, yeah, but 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 the, the, the vested you know interest is more for the for the industry yeah, and not right, no, for sure. versus somebody else. Uh, it's more that the industry can cannot ignore. You know, can there's not many. You know, think about any you know in, the insurance industry. The you know the you know the fintech. You know, property prop tech, health tech. Those are all very sophisticated industries. It's only trade tech really in our in our space that the logistics industry is really you know massively underserved. Yep. So we've talked a lot about Hapag. Can you give us a uh, so just as a background in April of twenty two? I think I have my date right. Uh, they made an announcement that you and another vendor were going to be equipping yeah. their entire fleet. Can you give us a little bit of? Uh, you know where they are in terms of that implementation and um and then secondarily i think a lot of people predicted that was going to be the first domino to fall where are we in terms of other lines um mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned o and e as well right that's another no. line that's committed to do it with a different vendor where are we in terms of like this becoming ubiquitous uh, across all the all the lines so first of all, it's an, you know it's an exciting time because uh, because Hapak has really pulled it through and and you know the the rollout is almost completed. It will be completed by the end of the year, okay. and they've done an incredible job in orchestrating that. You know it's the largest IoT rollout in in, in our industry. It's never been done that you digitize so many. You know it's a, it, it's a program where most people would have probably taken 
five years and 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 so they've reduced it to below two years they've also decided um to um to to lift the bar when it came come comes to you know the safety of the devices you know those are specifically certified devices there's a standard um and it's the first time that it's been done in the maritime industry because the hypothesis is that those devices need to be intrinsically safe. They can never be the root cause for any fire on anything. And that, that means it's even more difficult to build a sub $100 device because by definition, the devices need to be you know, airtight, tight against gases. They need to survive from you know, minus four Fahrenheit to you know, 122 or whatever it is. So it's an, an, extreme, uh, an extreme conditions. And, and, and um, I think... You know, very often in 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 Europe, we're we're being perceived as being very conservative. The the, the planning was really conservative, uh, but it's been ex executed by Hapak Lloyd, you know, flawlessly. It's really not easy, and again, it's never been done before to import devices to to a lot of different countries. So, you know, we had to import them from Jebel Ali to India to Pakistan to Saudi Arabia to Japan. You know. Again, you know, this is this it goes. There's lots of regulations if you want to import those devices. So building it is already, you know, inventing it is sophisticated. Then building it around the world in massive quantities in a time where where the supply chain was severely hit was not easy. But also actually deploying it around the globe um, and importing them to countries, uh, both for newly built containers as well. The entire uh, refurbishment uh, was was very well planned by Hapag Lloyd. And the service will be, you know, this is mainly to increase the quality offering to their own clients. The service will be rolled out at the end of the year. Very interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, importing and exporting technology devices in our current uh, sort of geopolitical system, not the easiest thing in the world to do. Well, so. and, and then try to build a device with, uh, it, it sounds awkward, but try to build a device with very few Chinese components in it. It's not it's not easy um yes. in, in in today's world um and, and 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 build it in you know you have to spread the also the assembly process around the world uh so that you actually minimize you know the time and the costs it actually also takes to deploy devices to you know to certain installation terminals you have to train teams you know this is this is you know a little bit you know if you if i would compare it to the car manufacturing industry this is a little bit you know the the Vorsprung durch Technik, you know, the, the the slogan where technology really uh, is really important, but it's also the sheer driving pleasure to a certain extent, mm -hmm. because uh, you know you have to install it very quickly, um, because it makes a big difference for one million containers if you need five minutes or you need one minute. Right. Uh, just imagine, you know, the time it actually takes to deploy and roll out. So we had to develop entirely new processes, train teams on the ground. The advantage is now that those teams have been really well trained for every other carrier in the world. And that leads yeah. to your second question. And then obviously, you know, ONE made that public announcement. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, it's a very small industry. Um, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, uh, with all our competitors. We try to help each other also because, you know, at the end of the day, um, this is, it's about the success of this industry being digitized. Um, and and so you know whenever somebody starts uh, either rollout or uh, or a test with somebody that's only positive, I visited you know every single of the largest um, uh, uh, carriers, and and uh, it's it's fair to say that everyone is looking at uh, at rolling out something sooner or later. Okay, interesting. Well, I think once that installation is complete and their service is based on it. Um, I think we might see a bit more urgency. But you see it everywhere. You know, you drive, at least in Europe, you drive on the on, on the motorway, you know, you constantly overtake, you know, lorries and you see our devices and uh, already, you know, sitting sitting on those lorries. So uh, actually, Hapak has gained already a lot of insights. You know, this is, you know, every day there is more, you know, if you think about it, you know, it, it's a world map. It used to be dark. And then suddenly there's real life signals popping up. And every day, you know, you add a couple thousand um, you know, the, the deployment speed is uh, more than 100,000 containers a month. And that's significant if you think about it. I mean, if you if you add all those containers, you know, you can imagine, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the work which has been involved obviously took us time to ramp it up. Yeah. But uh, but that's a massive, massive effort. 
So let me, I, I have a bunch of questions that unfortunately, I don't think we have we, We're running out of time. All of these. So I, uh, <laughs> we'll, we, I, I say this almost with every guest, but we're going to have to have you back at some point because there's right. lots more to talk about. But I did want to ask about one specific thing around the market right now. Um, and er, and uh, what I'll call urgency in the market. So obviously visibility became this huge need during the pandemic uh, when everybody, yeah. uh, you know, kind of lost sight and their transit times expanded significantly and carriers were struggling to understand where their assets were to cycle them back to the places where they could make a huge amount of money more than they'd ever seen before on each shipment. So how do you sort of plan from your perspective, how do you sort of plan through the cycles, knowing that there will be times when it's cr crazy amount of demand and there's times like now where it's, you know, it's not in a trough, but it's, it's, it's eased obviously. So how do you sort of view that from a sales perspective? You're asking the same questions my board asks me. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I swear I did not talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, so because everyone in the industry understands that the deployment takes a minimum of 18 months, yeah. everyone is, it's fair to say that everyone tests it already in, 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 in a significant amount. And everyone is looking at, not from a cost perspective, but everyone tries to understand the use cases so that you actually can recuperate the original investment. Because in today's world, and, and we saw you know, lots of announcements last year where people made, as you said, tons of profits. But we also saw recently a lot of announcements where those profits have actually come down. So the ROI for investments of hundreds of millions, and I think, you know, just by the definition of having a million or more containers, it's it, people can appreciate that it's investments of hundreds of millions. And the, the RI, which needs to be built, is also in a, in a relatively acceptable amount of time, whether that's two years or three years. So the way what we've done is together with our clients, we, we developed entire use cases of additional services which can be provided to their own clients, to their shippers. And, and as we said earlier, shippers are willing to pay money for reliability, for quality. And this is what... The project 44s of this world have successfully done educating the market that it's worthwhile to pay money for ETAs. But we've also developed you know, an entire set of um, services internally for operational efficiency, whether it's the optimization of moving you know, empty boxes around, you know, going directly from one client to another client instead of going back to the polls, et cetera. And there's an entire value book also around those ones. So I think it's fair to say that every single organization intensively looks at, um, you know, how quickly are we going to roll it out? We, we are never meeting the question, should we only be partially doing it for, for you know, a, a single part of a fleet or only a certain trade lane? It's always full fleet, you know, very similar, like they've done it on the reefer space. You know, again, reefer is a good, you know, a good example, at least for, <clears throat> for maritime. And, and it's it, the, the question, and, and this is probably where, where HAPAC um, ha, has also shown to the rest of the industry. On one side, it's an infrastructure investment. You want to have the most modern fleet in the world. And, and, and that's the quality of the containers, but it's also the quality of the data you're, being, you're generating. On the other side, you also want to have you know, new services and, 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 and shippers will... If you would have, it's about optionality. If you would have the optionality of selecting a carrier which provides you door to door with the full transparency, and it's about the same price as somebody else who doesn't do it, you will probably go with that particular carrier. And this yeah. is why I said earlier, no one really wants to be left out in, 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 in this game. Everyone understands that sooner or later they need to do that investment. Very interesting. Uh, and yes, container lines are still, they're not making as much as they did two years ago, but they're still making, I mean, we should all be in a business where our profits go down 83% and they're still over a billion dollars. So, exactly. <laughs> um, or, or, you know, as you, as you know, or, you know, there's certain companies in the world who are valued, you know, less than the cash. That's true. They own, so. Very true. Very true. So, um, um, it's attractive. 
So real quickly, last question. Every guest I ask, what's your favorite band or musician? And you have to tell me why. And it's probably not what my brand people would allow me to say, but it's uh, it's Eminem. Um, I've always been a big fan of, uh, of Eminem. And I know that... Um, the lyrics are very uh, controversial, but uh, and, and and politically not correct. But I like pretty much, you know. Uh, so first of all, his you know his technical skills are you know from a different world. If you think about songs like Rap God, etc., yeah. the way you know this brutal truth, also the way he talks about you know family struggles and mental yeah. you know illness and 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 bullying, etc., have always impressed me. And, and and probably also resilience. You know, he's he's come back, although that word is overstretched slightly. But I think we all know that life is peaks and valleys, and 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 it just doesn't always go up. So, um, in in whatever mood I am, I can always listen to him. That's very cool. Well, yeah, no one would dispute his talent for sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, Stefan, thank you so much. Awesome so conversation. Very. We have lots more to talk about some other time, and we'll we will do that at a JOC event or back on the show. But thank you exactly. so much for joining me. What's the best, the best place for people to reach out to you? And uh, um, for LinkedIn, they will find me for our webpage. Okay, fantastic. Super. Well, thanks again thanks so much. much. Really appreciate it. Bye bye. All right, really quickly, dad. Jo- we're already a minute over, so I'll speed through the end here. Dad joke of the week. This is from my son. He's obsessed with uh, soccer. It's the Women's World Cup final on Sunday. Viva España. Sorry, everyone in England. I'm going for Spain. What do you call it when a chicken makes a bad slide tackle? A foul. Obviously. Come on. You had to see that one coming. So hopefully see you at Inland next uh, month. Uh, hopefully see you at IAPH the World Ports Conference the month after that. And register for TPM. You're already behind the people who've uh, registered. If you haven't registered already, thank you so much to everyone uh, who tuned in today. Thank you for to Stefan for an awesome conversation about a really interesting topic. And we will be back in, I think, two weeks. This isn't one of those five Friday months. So uh, be back in two weeks with another fantastic guest. Um, have a great rest of your Friday and have a fantastic weekend.